here's one of the questions I want to start off with. Mm -hmm. And I've asked some other panelists this, and it's and it's kind of interesting what comes up. But, uh, you know, envision yourself at a neighborhood block party or cocktail party or something. And somebody says, well, what do you do? Okay, well, I'm in horticulture, and I do this, and I do that. What are some of the most frequently asked questions that you get about gardening and specifically about fall gardening. So who wants to go first on that one? Yeah, Diane, I'll take that from a, from a vegetable garden standpoint. Uh, the biggest questions we get are the most uh, asked question is what to plant and when. Those are the two biggest pain points I think gardeners face is what to do when. So I get those questions and they kind of sit back and talk to them about where they garden and at. We can figure it all out. There is ways to figure out what to plant when, but that's the biggest question I get. Excellent. Yes. A big one I get is what to cut back in the fall and, and what to leave. Um, I think pruning anything, even if it's just cutting something back, it is a tough one for um, new gardeners. So we'll get around to the answers to those in, in today. Yes. Um, Johnny, what's what's the question people ask you? You know, so last year we started selling some some bulbs as well. We sell some daffodils, I believe tulips this year in the fall and the caladiums in the spring. Um, and you notice that most garden centers bring these out around September when the soil is way too hot. So one of the questions that I constantly get um, like Greg is when to plant, you know, you should, you should wait until you have a maximum soil temperature of 60 degrees. And I, I talk to many people that have had failures because they plant too soon, the roots start to develop and, you know, then all the energy of the bulb is gone, but it dies as it freezes. So then once the spring comes around, there's no, there's no energy left um, to get your plants, to get your blooms. And that can be really disappointing. Uh, so soil temperature is, is incredibly important. And I'd say with bulbs, that is my my main question that I received. Mm -hmm. Great. And John, what about you? I, I can only imagine the questions you get when it comes to grubs and that kind of thing. <laughs> well, yeah, th this time of year, it's uh, uh, for folks that, that it's uh, maybe a new problem. Uh, the question is almost always, why are there crows, moles, voles, raccoons, skunks, or pigs ripping up my lawn? Uh, that's a big question. Or even the garden. Indeed. Yeah. So we'll get around to that. So so let's hear it. John, we have you on screen. And one of my first questions was, what treatment should I be giving my lawn um, in August, September, October? So let's just have you answer that question first. Uh, sure. Uh, well, most most folks in the spring do the fer fertilization and uh, put down uh, various insecticides, weed controls. Uh, most of the chemicals go down in the spring for uh, grub control if that's a problem in your particular area. Uh, get to get to midsummer, you, you know, you can put down a fert as well with some nitrogen. Uh, you know, less less so. Uh, and then uh, for for non chemical. Uh, grub controls. Uh, really, midsummer is a very good time to put down those controls. You're going after, uh, uh, like, let's say a homeowner uh, may may see Japanese beetles flying around, and that that's an easy problem to spot. Uh, different locales of the country, uh, and when those uh, beetles disappear, they're uh, working their way into the uh, soil. They lay their eggs, and within a couple weeks. Those uh, eggs hatch out as uh, what we call, uh, well, newly hatched grubs. We call them first instar grubs. And that's a very good target to go after for any of the products, chemicals or non-chemicals. So when you get to kind of this uh, mid-summer time, uh, mid-August, let's say in most locales, uh, uh, non-chemical products work well, chemical products work well. Ours, uh, Grub Gone or Beetle Gone sprayed work well in turf and soil in your garden. Uh, then if you get, uh, if you don't do any treatment, uh, this time of year, those grubs will keep growing. They get, they get a little tougher to kill. Uh, one of the chemicals, uh, grub X does not work very well. Once those grubs start growing, uh, uh, bare advanced, amidacloprid, which people are 
sort of shying away from in many parts of the country now that that actually that 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 chemical works very well this time of year and our our product works uh very very well all the way through october so these these fall season grubs uh so yeah that that's uh that that's a it it, it you know these infestations are growing so it, it's it, it's becoming an issue for people but uh yeah but there is a solution. So one of the questions that I have um, for those of us in cooler climates, should you be putting this down, you know, like your, your grub product a certain amount of time before like first frost does, does temperature have something to do with it? Or by the time it gets then to, to like first frost, does that mean it's going to be a lot harder to control? Yeah, that's a great question. The the grubs like warm weather, so uh, they're they're dormant over the winter. They overwinter deeper in the soil profile. So when the soil uh, when the soil temperature reaches, let's say fifty degrees Fahrenheit or so, that they're working their way deeper. They become dormant. They overwinter, so they're not going to be uh, tearing up your uh, your lawn or uh, eating the roots of your lawn, I should say. And also, there's not much foraging that goes on by the, uh, you know, the skunks and the moles and the voles, et cetera, going after those grubs when they're dormant. And uh, in the spring, when they start, uh, when the temperature reaches about 50, 55 degrees Fahrenheit, they start working their way closer to the surface, start eating the roots of your lawn and becoming very active. And, and that's a good time to put down product in the spring to get those overwintered grubs uh, and then come back in, you know, sort of early August, mid-August to get those newly hatched grubs. So I like that because it's it's perfect timing. We were just talking about. So treat for the grubs. And then Johnny, you said once the soil temperature gets to a certain 50, 60, then you can plant your bulbs. So Johnny, why don't, and you and Peggy Ann can share this one. So let's talk <laughs> about fall bulb planting and talk about it. I mean, because I always think of, oh, okay, in October, I'll plant my bulbs, but it's different in different parts of the country. So why don't you guys talk about planting fall bulbs and what people in various uh, parts of the country might be, and especially like warmer climates? I mean, are they going to have to chill their bulbs before they plant them? So I'll, I'll shut up now. I'll let you guys talk about planting. <laughs> Ken, do you want me to go first? <laughs> you go ahead. Ben. All right. So, you know, we're, we're going to talk in general generalities here, but, you know, September, October is great for zone four and five. Uh, you're looking at October, November for six and seven and um, November, December for eight and nine, maybe uh, late December for zone 10. And when you really start getting down into zone eight and farther, bulbs aren't going to get... Um, the cold period, the cold treatment that they need to bloom. And so you're going to want to either um, give the bulbs a cold treatment yourself or buy them pre-chilled. Um, so that's number one. So it is a good idea to wait, but you do want to give them time to put some roots down. Um, I usually put just a little tiny bit of an organic uh, fertilizer like bulb tone in the hole. I'm talking like a teaspoon, just a little bit, um, and then cover them up. Um, I plant a lot in the lawn um, and under deciduous trees and shrubs. And uh, my husband has also a horticulture, so we have the same disease. So we have way too many bulbs. They are everywhere we live. Um, and the only way I could still do it is with a power planter. And I have two. Um, I have quite a long one. And that's great when you're planting a lot because one of us can stand up straight and dig the holes while the other one drops the bulb in the hole and covers it up. And I have a short one. And I like the short one when I'm working alone um, because I can use both hands on that short one easily while I'm kneeling on the ground and plant the bulbs at the same time. I would, I would advise you to get two. You'll have them for the rest of your life. And um, I'll tell you what, it, it's going to make the world of difference. I wouldn't plant a bulb lawn when I'm putting in thousands of bulbs without one. I just wouldn't. So I like what you're saying, Peggy Ann. I think my new theme is the couple who plants together stays together. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Okay, Johnny, what else do you want to add about planting uh, fall bulbs? Sure. So, uh, you know, Peggy stole my thunder a little bit, but that is quite all right. It's always great to hear somebody that's successfully using power planters. 
Um, and, and, you know, so, so there's several different ways to plant bulbs, like Peggy's planting lawns under her trees. So I actually use them as borders of all of my landscaping. So I have a, you know, when I pull up to my house, I have a very nice bloom before anything else is really taken off. And I think it's lovely. But even with that, there's multiple ways to plant. Um, Peggy, you probably have, say, a two-inch diameter and a three-inch diameter power planter, which is what we really gear mm -hmm. towards bulbs. You know, they're, they're fine sizes. You drill your hole. You've got plenty of space for one bulb. I spoke with many people, um, and I can't say that this is industry standard, but they use a larger auger, say a seven-inch or eight-inch diameter, and they actually plant cold clusters. And you mm -hmm. do this the same way. Uh, you know, when you're choosing your power planters, the, the type of power drill that you have is important. So it's always a great idea to give us a call and let us guide you through that process. Because what we do not want is you buying an incorrect combination, buying something that you don't need, or the worst, buying something that's just not going to work for you. Um, and it's like Peggy said, when you're, when you're planting thousands, it's incredibly easy. And if you were to compare, you know, a shovel or the bulb planting tool that you step on and you're taking out plugs, I mean, it's night and day difference. There's really no comparison. I plant, let's see, last year, I'd say I planted about 500 bulbs. So, so Peggy, you're in a, you are in a different world than I am, but I planted about 500 bulbs and it took me an hour and a half, mm -hmm. which yeah. I don't know how long that would have taken me if I was pulling plugs out of my yard. Right. Dan and I planted uh, a bulb lawn in our front yard a couple of years ago with a power planter. And we put in oh, three or 4,000 bulbs in a morning. <laughs> yeah. A morning. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yes. So um, let's talk a little bit about um, designing with bulbs. Johnny, you said you plant them as a border. Peggy, you did a lawn. Gail just posted um the blog that you wrote for us, Peggy, about lawn. Um, but one of the things I always see when they talk about design is don't make them little soldiers in a row. And so, Johnny, I was liking how you said, you know, use the larger auger and then plant them in clumps. So let's let's tell people how to avoid the little soldier in a row and why you may not want to do that. You want to start this one, Johnny? Sure. So I will say that I definitely have some soldiers in a row. Um, not, not so much <laughs> anymore, but when I first started planting them, yes. Um, and and I have found that, you know, the, the spacing, the spacing is much closer than I would have assumed at first. You know, but when you're so when you're doing that, you you can alternate and it can all be all be very close. What I do, I use almost a Z pattern and I, I alternate with colors. But when you're planting the larger power planter, um, I always put the same, the same species in the same hole. All tulips are all daffodils, etc. Um, but you can mix your colors, you know, and then you don't you don't have a soldier anymore. Then you have a little army of tulips. Yeah. Um, designing, I'm no I'm no good at designing. I I just kind of go with the flow. And in the spring, I'm I'm generally thrilled with <laughs> with my fall planning. Yeah, you know, and I, I think there are different aesthetics because I really like Johnny's idea of using the really wide bulb auger. And so that's one strategy to use that. Or some people just like lift up one piece of sod and plant in that and make sporadic little groups around the lawn or things like that. And that is a very natural look and it's very pretty. Um, I'm kind of a more is more girl when it comes to bulbs. So I plant them really close together and lots of them. And they all naturalize. And so I get more and more and more every year. Um, one thing I want people to know is I think tulips are sometimes difficult because not all tulips come back every year. So you really want to look for tulips that are perennial. And then you're looking for the smaller botanic tulips, which I absolutely love. You're looking at Darwin hybrids or triumphs. Um, those are things that are going to come back every year. Um, but you should remember if you want this big colorful display of these gorgeous things you saw in the catalog that are fully double or look like ice cream cones, go for it. The price point is very low and you can put those in as an annual. You know, you bought that hanging basket for $30 and you're gonna compost that too. So start planting bulbs as annuals. And, you know, I think more is better. I think the pictures people see of the Netherlands with these seas of bulbs more um, 
looks very exciting. It's also better for pollinators to be able to find them. And they're a great source of nectar and pollen for very early season um, pollinators. So more is more, but let's remember, you pay the mortgage at your house. So you plan whatever you think is beautiful. There you go. And let me, let me add one more thing. Um, so this is another technique. Um, so you can make a trench with a power planter as well. You know, if another technique that I use when I'm doing a border, I'm going to drill these holes nearly touching, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in whatever distance that I choose. But once the holes are drilled, I can basically take my tool, put it in the first first hole, tilt it a little, and then I just walk backwards. And then I have a nice trench with pulverized soil. You dump your bulbs, you backfill, and then you wait for spring. Patience. A gardener's uh, most oh, beneficial yes. attribute, right, is the patience till we get right. there. And I'm just yeah. going to ask one more thing because back to the more is more. Try to plant in succession so that you have uh, a bulbs in bloom from in, in my yard in zone seven, Delaware, uh, starts at the end of January and they bloom through June. So um, when you're looking at catalogs, look at things like er very early season, spring, mid spring, late spring, summer, and buy things that flower in all of those different time periods. Um, you know, even with something like daffodils, and there are hundreds of thousands of those, you can plant them that flower all at different times. So you can keep that um, keep that bloom going and get your season of color started months early and they will get you outside and, and amazed at what you're seeing out there. So extend your season as long as you can, plant in succession so you just have the most beautiful garden for, for months before anything else even wakes up. I was so glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you about the different early season, mid season, late season. And I want to reiterate what you just said, Peggy, too, is um, the fact that some of the earliest blooming bulb crops are the first for food, first food for our pollinators. So yet another reason. I mean, you can be the first on the block. You can be have the first ones for your pollinator friends, first one with color. So yeah, doing those early seasons. Um, Greg, did you want to add anything about uh, any bulb planting in your neck of the woods? No, bulbs not necessarily especially, but we do enjoy the color for them. I guarantee you that. And they do make an uh, absolutely stunning asset to the garden. Uh, I think we would, as uh, Peggy said, we would plant ours here in the deep south in November and December. And most of the time we plant tulips, they are annuals for us in the south. But there's a whole host of bulbs that we do enjoy in our southern gardens. Excellent, excellent. Okay, you know, in so, my vegetable garden, when, when it's empty in the winter, I plant that full of tulips, so I have cuts in the spring. Very good idea, yes. Okay, so let's talk about um, fall cleanup. Um, Peggy Ann, I think you said that that's one of the questions you get, and um, so what do we do? Do we have to cut down things? How do we know what to cut down, what to leave? Should we be leaving some debris as compost for some of those overwintering insects and beneficials? So there's a lot there that I'm sure all four panelists would like to <laughs> throw in some, some tips here. Who would you like to start? Anybody can start. It sounds like you got something to say, Peggy. So let's jump in. <laughs> no, I think it's kind of a tough question because there, there, there's this juxtaposition of having your garden look somewhat neat for your neighbors and, and all of that, but also wanting to provide habitat for wildlife and pollinators. And to be very honest, you know, there's the book and what happens in real life. And my husband and I have busy jobs and we've got over an acre of garden to care for. And sometimes we have to do things when it fits into our schedule. Um, and so in part of our front yard is um, like a pocket meadow full of native plants that are just, um, well, there's bulbs in the spring and then the rest of the year, gorgeous native plants that are, uh, you know, working for the pollinators. Because that's in the front yard, what we'll do is kind of early before um, the insects have nested in stems and things like that. We'll cut that down. We mulch mow it in the driveway 
and we put all that organic matter back. It looks neat. The trees are still standing. Everything's fine. In the backyard, we have a pocket meadow and we leave that completely. And we don't do anything until the insects have emerged in the spring. And then we just mow that down too. So in the front yard, animals still can be living in the duff um, that you've put back. All of the organic matter goes back. No organic matter ever leaves the property. So those are things, um, you know, probably with most of your shrubs, you're going to wait to to do some pruning. Um, if you can chip those and put them back into the beds, that's great. Um, and I, you know, I would ask people to think about some winter silhouettes if they're if they're used to a very clean garden and lots of folks are and that's not wrong try to look at things like your grasses and um maybe the round heads of allium and other things and try to learn to see the beauty in that in the winter maybe when they're covered with snow and try to teach yourself that a little messy is really okay good points um, Greg, what about uh, the vegetable garden? So talk a little bit about your vegetable garden. What should you clean up? What is it okay that maybe you leave there over winter? Well, the thing with vegetable garden is you want some good housekeeping there because pests such as insects and disease can harbor up. And we want to keep our vegetable gardens pretty clean. We all have the tendency to let some of the vegetables stay out there a little bit too long. And all that does is just harbor those insects and diseases that can come back next year and bite us. So what I like to do is just as soon as that plant quits giving you produce or food, it's time to get it out. Move it out, put it in the compost bin, start that process. Also, if we got leaves out there in our garden, we like to get those up, put them in the compost bin. The one thing to think about when we think about composting is it takes one third of nitrogen to two thirds carbon to make proper compost. A lot of times we have plenty of carbon, such as spent plant material or leaves, but we don't have enough nitrogen to make that process work off. We can do that with what we call green manure, which is green matter or some type of animal manure to get in there and mix up, give it sufficient moisture and air so that we can have some good compost come springtime. So making good compost on the, uh, in the garden is a great practice to have a good compost bin. And from a vegetable garden standpoint, keeping everything clean and pulled out and everything is a huge benefit when we start managing our pests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good tips. What about cover crops in a vegetable garden? Cover crops, we're huge believers in cover crops. So if I've got a plot that I'm not going to use for a prolonged period of time, I love to use cover crops. Several reasons for that. It puts back biomass into my soil, organic matter back into my soil. Also, it holds my soil in place. So if we get one of those big rains, it doesn't wash my soil away. And most of them are great for pollinators. Our cover crops, such as clovers, such as peas and things like that, our pollinators love them. One thing that I've made a conscious effort of in this last year was keeping something blooming all the time for my native pollinators. Cover crops works a lot for that. Fits in that window where I may not have a food crop growing, but cover crops do that. So we're huge believers in cover crops. Although we have, we have a whole host of what we call legumes that put nitrogen back into our soil. So cover crops works extremely well in certain situations. Now, as far as mulch goes, they is a place for mulch in the vegetable garden. And the crop that comes to mind to me, first of all, is strawberries. We have particular crops we like to mulch. Strawberries is probably the one that we, we need to mulch the most. So they are crops we need to mulch to set up going into wintertime, and they are places we can use cover crops. Okay, anybody else have uh, anything to add to some of those um, tips that Greg gave us about vegetable gardening that was good? Um, but Greg, uh, there's certain things that you can plant in the fall as well. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, which vegetables might you plant in fall and you know, how many weeks before first frost, that kind of thing? Okay, so so one of the main things people know as far as vegetable going is know when your first frost state is in fall. And that helps you plan backwards what you can plant now and be successful with. 
So for me here in zone nine, my first average frost date is around November 22nd. So if I back off from that, I'm about 90 days out now, 90-ish days out from that. Well, let me see. It's uh, October, November. I'm about 60-something days out, excuse me, from that. So I back off from that. I know that I can plant most of my brassicas now broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, things like that. And then I'll have good mature plants going into the wintertime when I start getting some cold weather. Carrots, we love to overwinter our carrots. Spinach, spinach loves cold weather. And here in the deep south, we can plant our bubba onions. Now our friends up north can plant such things as bunching onions or um, other type of onions so that we can have some, some food during the wintertime there. But the fall is a great time to plant some of these crops so we can overwinter or we can harvest early fall or early fall. Very good. Let's talk about fertilization. I mean, there's so many different topics. So it's we almost have to take it crop class by crop class, but uh do you fertil Peggy, you said something about putting um some bulb fertilizer in the holes when you're planting your bulbs? What about beds that have perennials and annuals in? What about your lawn? You know, we had talked about uh, treating for grubs and that, but what about other fertilizers in the lawn? Uh, we talked about cover crops. Is there other fertilizer that maybe you need to spread on your vegetable garden in the fall? So I'm not sure who wants to take the first one on that one. That was a big question. Well, I'll speak to it from a vegetable perspective. Yes, we need to think about fertility going into the fall. Now, one thing that we need to understand is some of our organic fertilizers don't react as, as quick in the fall and cool weather as they do in warm weather. So if we're strictly an organic gardener, we need to think about fertilizing a little bit different. Of course, our phosphorus is going to be there, our potassium is going to be there, but most of our nitrogen sources break down and become available to the plant at a lot slower rate than they do in hot weather. So yes, all of our fall vegetables need fertility. We just may have to tweak that according to the soil temperatures that we have and how these fertilizers react to the microbes in the soil different times of years and how they become available. So I will add, um, specifically to ornamental gardens, um, maybe it works with vegetables too. I'm sure it does. It works with grasses. Um, but you know, there's many, there's many things to consider with, with fertilizer, nitrogen being one of them, but one that I don't think is talked about as often is the, the non, the non-food parts of the fertilizer, um, specifically your mycorrhizal fungi. You know, every, every spring I either use something like a biotone, um, a new one is called grow tab and it's just a tablet that you drop in the hole, hole intended to touch the roots. And as you know, all of those nutrients are great, but the plants need a way to be able to absorb the nutrients. So you find something with your mycorrhizal, nearly all of your other biologicals, your inoculants, and then you're using more of the fertilizer that you're dumping. It's not just settling and going to our water table. You are so right. And all the research is pointing directly at what Johnny was saying. It's about feeding your soil so your soil can feed your plants. Um, so I think that's great advice. And, um, you know, like Greg was saying, so when you're planting bulbs, you're not really looking for nitrogen. You want them to put down roots. And so an organic fertilizer like bone meal or bulb tone, um, that'll be enough to get them kind of going and, and help them um, set some roots uh, in the fall. Um, um, personally, I prefer um, organic fertilizers to uh, others. If you want, you could use something like a 10-10-10 or a 10-15-10 for your bulbs, but don't put it in the hole, put it on top, it will burn them. Um, I think folks at home just should remember that more isn't necessarily better, uh, especially when you're talking about um, um, synthetic fertilizers. I know we all have the tendency to really want to love our plants and um, you know, and if a pound will do, well, two would be better, but it's not. Um, so hang on. Uh, one thing, uh, we love all of our fallen leaves just to death, and we collect all of them and take some from the neighbors too, and we mulch them up and we make leaf mold, and we cover everything with leaf mold. 
um, and that just helps. I'm still an old fashioned girl and believe in manure, um, cow manure, which uh, I, I still use and, and certainly uh, even with my vegetables. Um, so there's a lot of things, you know, just putting some of that, uh, your plant uh, debris and leaves and all those, putting those back so your soil can reabsorb them is a great idea. And yes, get anything with mycorrhiza because um, again, that's just been proven again and again and again, we need to feed our soil. Okay, and what about our uh, bashful incognito, John? Uh, you wanna add anything to this discussion about uh, fertilization in fall? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit of knowledge. I, uh, this is above my pay grade, but uh, I'll, I'll just say from uh, kind of a general trend, what you're seeing uh, definitely in lawn care, turf care, uh, from landscapers, uh, manufacturers, sellers of products, they're really starting to be very conscientious broadly uh, about NPK values, right? Nitrogen, potassium, uh, or sorry, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So uh, phosphorus is the, uh, is, is, is the chemical they're really ramping down in the fertilizers. Uh, I think Peggy Ann could attest to that. And, uh, you know, for lawns, uh, a lot of the ferts, uh, they're, they're not even carrying phosphorus any longer. Um, you know, like a spring for NPK value might be a 30, 0, 10. Midsummer, they'll keep some nitrogen in there, get a little boost on, on the fertilization. Midsummer, maybe go a, a 15, 0, 0. Uh, but, uh, you know, the young guns I see in landscape care, they've really, uh, they over the past five, six, seven seasons, they've really been able to figure out a nice program of fertilization uh and insect control et cetera, et cetera, weed control included where they're using all non-chemical products and uh these are all guys that, that really go deep into this uh like uh, the panel here on on what they know and uh they're starting to take these programs nationally which is pretty interesting so they're starting to stamp out lawn care companies and and really the heart of it started up in the northeast and it's starting to spread from there uh so so it's pretty interesting uh you know there's uh there's a couple couple landscape care guys or turf care guys i could uh throw out some uh emails and uh, uh folks out there in the the world wide web uh on uh on the call today want to contact them and and talk with them a little bit uh they're very knowledgeable one is uh joe magazi at green earth ag and turf he's uh out of connecticut he's a distributor of all sorts of different non-chemical products and and he's very knowledgeable so that's joe magazi at green earth ag and turf hey john stay here because we have a specific question for you um the question oh. is, I would like to control grubs, but don't want to harm native bees, butterflies, and earthworms. I also have problems with armadillos. What do I do? <laughs> oh, yeah, those armadillos. I forgot to I forgot to add them into the forager category. <laughs> we don't have armadillos out west. Got everything else. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, any of the non-chemical products, whether you're talking milky spore, or nematodes or our uh, bacillus uh, thuringiensis based products, uh, grub gone, beetle gone. They, they have a very, uh, what we call a, a narrow spectrum of activity, meaning they really, uh, they're toxic or control a certain type of insect. Uh, for instance, milky spore probably has the most narrow spectrum and it only Oh, it'll, it'll only kill or control Japanese beetle grubs. That's it, right? That's very narrow. So uh, if, you, if you have Japanese beetle grubs, milky spore, you know, by their own uh, label, it you, you got to use it, probably apply it six, eight times over a two-year period for it to build up in the soil and get a certain level of control. Uh, nematodes, much more broad uh, spectrum of control. It'll, it'll control a variety of, of insects, um, it, it's it's sort of low to mid-level control. And, and what I mean by that, uh, about 40% control. So if you got 100 grubs you're trying to get rid of, it'll maybe control 40. 
milky spores more like in the 20 to 25 percent range um our bt products they actually they're actually very high level control uh pretty close well about the level of grub x uh that particular product on the retail side uh not quite as good as the imidacloprid like bear advanced uh but pretty close so ours are about 80 to low 90 percent control and uh, for, for our product, it's really the only BT product out there for grub control. It's, uh, the granular is grub gone. Uh, you can also spray it. Um, and most people buy beetle gone, a sprayable product to spray foliage to control adult beetles like Japanese beetle, but you can, you can till it in dry into your soil, your garden soil to control grubs. You can ground spray it on soil or turf to control grubs. Um, so that, that, that's, that, those are the non-chemicals and, and all of those, I guess, to answer the question, uh, none of those will kill pollinators, uh, your bees and butterflies. Uh, unfortunately, the, you know, the chemicals, they're, they're much more broad spectrum. They will, um, they will kill uh, uh, pollinators, of course, if they come in contact. Uh, earthworms, <laughs> if you're using, uh, you know, product in the turf, they're, they're going to kill earthworms if you're worried about worried about earthworms uh i guess the key to using the chemicals in the ground is um a consideration which helps pollinators is point of contact so if you're using a granular and you're irrigating it in or you let the rain irrigate it in it's probably not going to come in contact with bees and butterflies right unless you have dandelions if you're spraying it that's a whole different story you got to be very careful so it, you know just look at your situation um you can, you can mix products as well. Uh, I know in the article that uh, looks like uh, Gail posted, uh, we, we, we test our product, uh, our products mixed with chemicals. Uh, that's how traditionally BT products have been used in ag uh, worldwide. Uh, and uh, really, uh, when you can marry up a, a good non-chemical with a good chemical, you can actually drop the rate of chemical that you use quite a bit. So, uh, in that article, we talked a little bit about that and what we've uh, seen in a lot of field trial studies in turf is that uh, it will, we'll test with imidacloprid or the bare advanced on the retail side. And you can drop, uh, if, if you use our product mixed at half low label rate, that's half the lowest label rate on the label, mix it with half low label rate of the chemical, you actually get a bump in control of grubs uh, higher than any of the products as standalone. So these products, uh, if, if they're different, if they work in different ways, you can actually ramp your chemical load way down, get better control by dosing in our product or another uh, non-chemical product as well. So that's one strategy to try. And then again, you're, you know, you're being a better steward to your environment and uh, just uh, reducing the risk of uh, taking out pollinators. Great. Thank you. I'm glad that question was asked. Um, so now, Johnny, we have a question for you. Um, does your power planter cause the soil around it to compact, like around the edge when you're planting in clay soil, which bummer clay soil, but um, does it cause any compaction? So great timing. I was actually typing the answer to this question. <laughs> so, um, so compacting, no. Can it leave smooth walls just as a shovel can? Absolutely. So the technique that most people will use is once they're at the approximate depth that they want, you're going to rotate the whole tool in a circle. You're basically going to ream out the hole just like you would wood. And that's going to eat through the sides a little bit and it's going to break it up because you're not going to uniformly circle over and over in the exact same pattern. Um, we have plenty, I'd say, I'd say the majority of our customers are planting clay. Our largest sales location locations would be the Carolinas, Georgia, and Alabama. And uh, they, they have, they have no lack of clay soil there. So as long as you're using the right techniques, you have absolutely nothing to worry about with that. Great, thank you. Um, okay, Peggy Ann, these questions are for you, I believe. A, 
what does your lawn look like after the blooms are done and all you have left is the dying foliage? So what do you do about mowing? Well, that's a great question. Um, when I was a landscape designer, I used to always tell my clients, nobody's pretty all the time. So let's remember that. <laughs> so I, I, my neighbors love the ball blonde. They're all walkers. Everybody's walking around all the time. So the flowers start to bloom like in late Jan January and they're blooming, blooming, blooming. And now everybody's kind of finished blooming and, this, and, and the grass is also growing, of course, in between those bulbs. So by about mid-May, my the grass and the bulbs are about a foot tall, right? But I've left a path around the bulb lawn, about three feet between the bulb lawn and all of the borders, also so I can get in to the borders for maintenance. But also giving it that frame makes it look very neat and intentional, even when the grass is a foot high. So, um, and actually the grass will be starting to go to seed at about that time. And that's when I can cut them back. So the first thing I do is I knock it down with a string trimmer. If you tried to do that with your lawnmower, it would be an unhappy experience. Drop that. And what it'll do is it'll dry out. It'll drop the grass seed, which is better. You can put a little grass seed back. That's not going to hurt. And as it dries out, it's going to make mowing very easy. So the next week when it's time to mow, I'll mow that kind of high and, um, you know, it'll munch up all of the dry things that have been sitting there. Mm -hmm. And so it will look like, uh, honestly, it's not going to be as green and lush as a lawn, although my lawn is never fertilized <laughs> or irrigated. But it will look a little more yellow because you've just taken all of that, um, you know, all of that debris off. Um, but it greens up. It's grass. You, you can't stop it. It greens up very quickly. If you wanted to be uh, really sure, you could spread a little grass seed on there and set up the sprinkler. And in, I would say in about two weeks, it's back to green and it's really hardly noticeable. Um, but that is part of... You know, it's not a no mow May, and I'm not sure I completely agree with no mow May anyway, um, but it really is cutting down on the amount of times I mow that area. So you, remember, you are going to go through those periods, and, and, and that's nature. Um, but I think keeping a frame around it, making it look intentional, and it really um, helps the aesthetic um, for all the people in your neighborhood that you are teaching about this amazing way to plant and what's good for nature. Uh, okay. A, the frame around it is a wonderful idea. And B, sounds like a very small price to pay to have all those blooms in your yard from January to May. So it sounds like it's very worth it. And like you say, your neighbors love it. They see all the bloom time. So if they've got a week or two where it's like, oh, that grass needs to be mowed. So, okay, so what? <laughs> yeah, I, exactly. And you know what, when you tell people what the intention is, and people stop you and they're out walking their dogs, they get so excited. It's like, a, like, they didn't know you could do that, like, bulbs in your grass, that's crazy. Um, but you know, these planting bulbs in lawns in the Netherlands is, are called Stinson Gardens. Um, and where I used to live, many of these gardens still exist, and they're four or 500 years old. They're fine. You don't have to. <laughs> they're still good. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So to go along with the bulb planting, um, what about in containers? What about layering them for different height oh, yeah. and bloom times? Take it away. Lasagna planting has like been the new coolest thing on the block. I didn't think of it, but um, the, the flowerbulbs.eu did. And it's really great. It's just a fun way to plant containers in layers. And so the latest flowering bulbs will be on the bottom and moving up layer by layer to the smallest, earliest flowering bulbs. And that way in the same pot, you'll have that same succession of things blooming, um, you know, week after week. If you go to flowerbulbs.com, you can see a recipe of it. So that's really fun. Um, I'm from Minnesota where you can't leave anything outside. Um, so the rule of thumb is if you want to plant plants or bulbs in containers, they've got to be at least two zones hardier than where you're planting. So here I am in zone seven. So if I was going to leave a pot outside, the things that you put in, it should be hardy to zone five. And I would still put them in a protected location. 
Um, when you get down to where Greg is, I mean, you guys can do anything in the world and it's fine. Um, but, um, you know, people in Minnesota, yeah, just forget it or uh, put it in, <laughs> put them in your garage and, you know, cross your fingers and hope. Um, but it is possible. And that is such a fun way to use bulbs. I also plant a bunch in the fall and I put them in my window wells. And um, what happens is in the very early spring, I can bring them in the house and wake them up. And they make the greatest gifts. Um, I have a lot of um, family that are too old to guard these days. So when I can bring them a pot of freshly blooming bulbs, they get pretty excited about it. Yeah, indeed. Okay, shifting gears again, um, let's talk about covering plants. And of course, it's different for different re regions and it's different for different plants. You know, I see people put the rose cones on. I mm -hmm. see other people wrap their shrubs typically, um, you know, in burlap or something. So what can our panel tell us about some of these things? Do it, don't do it, only do it in the north, only do it in the south. I, I, tell, us, tell us what the do's and don'ts are. Well, from a baseball uh, standpoint here, it's not a matter of if we're going to cold weather, but when we're going to have cold weather. And every time these fronts kind of sneak up on us. So instead of waiting to the last minute to stock up on some good frost covers, go ahead and buy you some of them, put them in your garden shed that you have them when the time comes, because the time will come when you have to use a good garden cover. For us with the brassicas, such as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, any of those, we like to cover them up. Anything that's going to be below about 22 degrees. Strawberries, same thing, around 20 degrees. We like to cover them up. And the next day, you can go out there, when the sun comes out, and you take those covers off, you can reapply them as need be. But waiting until the last minute and panicking and trying to figure out what you're going to do is not necessarily a good strategy to have. So have some frost covers on hand so that we can go out there and cover up when we get those cold spells in. For onions here in the south, anything under about 20 degrees, we like to cover up. Now, such things such as Swiss chard, spinach, a little more cold tolerant, and we can let it get down into the low teens before we have to worry about those. But for the most part, most of our vegetables, we like to cover up and protect around 20, 22 degrees. All right, good. Anybody else have uh, anything on maybe covering shrubs or perennials or anything? You know, in the far north, um, you know, and I know you know about Minnesota, Diane, um, there's the, called the Minnesota tip where people dig up their roses and actually bury the whole plant, um, which is a, a, a big chore every year. Or, you know, some of the shrub roses that are out now have um, more cold tolerance. Um, so things like that, some, some shrubs, like I would say like buxus, for instance, in some places it's too cold and dry and, um, the dryness actually is almost worse than the temperatures. And so I know some people will wrap their shrubs with, um, uh, what we're seeing burlap, um, you know, to try and mitigate that, um, snow cover is, is a really good way to protect your plants. If you get some, if you have an open winter, that's more of a problem. But, you know, I think what Craig is saying is be prepared and don't wait for that day to come. Um, I think that's really good advice. I don't actually cover anything in my zone seven garden um, because if it's got to live through the school of hard knocks over here um, and I don't do that, but I just think that's awfully good advice just be ready if you know it's going to come and you know you have problems and you're pushing that envelope and which I say go for uh just be ready actually we have a gravel gardens just outside my window and that's where we challenge everything and put it in the ground and see if it will die um and you know some years we'll have a eucalyptus tree for five years and then we won't uh it'll die so um you know go out and um push those limits um but try to do it uh you know, wisely with um, having your um, staples on hand to be able to take care of those in, in nasty weather. I like the uh, winter of hard knocks. I mean, okay, <laughs> if it takes it out, it takes it out. Okay, that's fine. That means I get to buy something new and plant it in and try something else. And, and I've got it exactly. Yeah, perfect. But, 
but know your zone and read the tags, know about that. Okay, so here's my question because I wanna know and I'm not good at this. So Greg, tell me what I should be doing in the fall to clean my tools. What's, what's some tips and how do you store them? Cause I'm really bad at this. Well, we all have those days in the fall of the year when the weather's bad and we don't have anything to do. We can't get out in the garden work. That's the perfect time to get underneath the shelter and get those tools out, get them cleaned up. The first thing is take your wire brush and clean all that excess dirt off of them. And then use something like a WD-40. You can use any kind of loop kit to put on those metal areas, those bare metal areas, so we can discourage rust. We want to protect that metal. And then for our wood handles, especially the ones that's been exposed a little bit, we want to sand those down, make them nice and smooth again. So use something like a 220 sandpaper, anything to just take that rough edge off of them where they've been weathered. And then treat our wood handles with linseed oil. Let them lay out there a few days. Let that linseed oil dry in really well. And that'll help protect our wood so that if we do happen to leave them out in the rain, that water's going to repel off of them. So linseed oil for metal. Clean up those metal tools and get all that dust and excess rust off of them and put some type of protected on there is a great way to spend that cold, cloudy winter day. Okay, I love that. I will do that the first cold, cold and cloudy winter day. Um, what about sharpening your tools? Yeah, so we like to use what we call a farmer's file, which is a double-sided file. It's coarse on one side and it's fine on the other side. Uh, that's something that's easily you can you, uh, leave out in the tool shed. You can grab it and, uh, and sharpen those tools with that. Of course, hit it with the coarse side if you need to get uh, excess metal off there and finish it off with that uh, fine side there to, to sharpen it up. Excellent. Okay, I just looked at the clock and I didn't realize we were already already there, but... I want each of our panelists, so we have one, two, three, four panelists. Each of you take a minute. Your, your last little tip or piece of advice about fall gardening tasks. And Greg, I see you on my screen. So I'm going to have you go first and then we'll go through the other panelists. Okay, this is one thing I think everybody should know is when that average first frost date is in the fall of the year. You can find this information out by going to the USDA hardness zone. You can Google that. It'll come up. You can put in your zip code or whatever and find out what your average frost state is for your area. That'll help you judge about your planting schedule when you need to plant. Now, I'm going to give everybody one little tip out there that you may not know. Try growing celery in a container. Now, celery... Below 20 degrees, will get some damage. Put it in a container where you can move it in out of the weather, put it back out. Homegrown celery in the fall of the year is one of the funnest things to do, and it's absolutely delicious. Okay, I'm going to try it. Love celery. I'll, I'll, you're giving me a lot of tasks to do. I'm going to have to take vacation to do all this. Um, okay, Johnny, how about your one-minute fall gardening advice? So maybe this isn't necessarily fall gardening advice. My fall gardening advice is 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 do it, but don't limit yourself to the spring. Um, fall bulbs, anything that you can plant in the fall will get you out, it'll get you exercising, and you're going to love it. What I want to hit on is, is another thing with not limiting. Your power planter is not only for digging holes. If you own one, get every penny out of it that you can. If you're composting, you don't have to use that pitchfork. It's a blender. You can turn your compost with a power planter. If the one you purchased is long enough, you can horizontal bore. So if you're running drip line under a sidewalk, maybe maybe you don't have to call the guys to come help. You could do it yourself with that power planter. Any other you know tips or tricks? We are always available at the office where you can fill a contact form out on powerplanter.com. If we cannot answer the question, we're not you know just going to try to pull something out of the air. We will let you know and we will not steer you wrong. Great. Thank you. Okay, Peggy, your one minute tip. All right. Uh, plant bulbs. You're going to really like yourself next spring. Um, second one is plant bulbs for somebody else. Get the kids. Go to grandma's neighbor that shut in anybody and uh, plant some memories. I love that. Love it. Okay, John, you have to top that one. 
<laughs> All right, I'll try. I'll try. I'll dovetail off uh, the the rest of the panelists. So, uh, how about after you get your exercise in the fall, planting bulbs, you know, uh, having your family out there with you, learning how to do some gardening, and before the cold winter days hit and the rain and snow, when you're cleaning your tools inside, after you plant those bulbs, enjoy a cold beer and a cocktail in your garden next to your garden and enjoy it. How about that? Okay. I think I'm taking your advice first and then yeah. everybody else. Says. I agree. I agree. He's got it right. <laughs> yeah, that is. I mean, that's why we do all this work, right? I, it's not work. It's fun. It's a hobby, but we go. want it so that we can enjoy it. So I love it. That was, that was great for the final tip. So, mm -hmm. um, Sorry, we have to come to a close. We we fulfilled our hour a little bit more than that. But to our panelists, Peggy Ann, Johnny, John, and Greg, thank you so much for all your tips and advice. I know we had a broad topic. We are trying to hit as many things as possible. It's all about fall gardening. Um, so we need to have all of you guys back next year and we'll we'll hone in on some of your many areas of expertise. But with that, I want to say thank you. Have a wonderful afternoon, evening. Have a wonderful fall. My favorite time of year. So enjoy it in the garden, outside the garden, having a cocktail, polishing your tools, whatever yeah. you're doing. Have <laughs> a wonderful fall, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.